Well, good morning, everyone. Good to be here today. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I couldn't do this without you. <laughs> you know, we're about halfway through summertime already, halfway through the year anyway. In Texas, of course, summertime is about all three seasons, three out of four summertime. And yet, uh, here we are right in the middle of the Gospel of Mark. If you're not familiar with the Episcopal Church, we, uh, we read through one of the Gospels uh, during the summertime, all the way up to about Advent, or right around Christmas time. So every Sunday we'll be reading from this Gospel for uh, many weeks to come. And today, uh, Jesus has taken his uh, friends and his disciples in the boat to get away from the crowds. But then it turns out the crowds show up anyway. And even as he's trying to get away from the crowds, when he shows up and he sees all the people, it says that the way he looks at them as if uh, they were like sheep who didn't know which way to go. They didn't have anybody to lead them. Lead them to the grass, lead them to the water, lead them to uh, the next pasture. The people were uh, aimless and uh, directionless. So today I wanted to do something a little different. You know when I talk to you all, the most of the time I, I try to talk about your life and my life, the life of the community, talk about your spiritual life and my spiritual life. But to do something a little different today, I wanted to expand the conversation outward a little bit and talk about uh, things larger than just uh, your personal life and my life. Think about the people who are uh, not here in church with you today. Um, think about the folks who are kind of outside the church world. How many, what percentage of folks do you think are not in any kind of a church world. What percentage of people do you think, not the ones who just don't go to church, but the ones who actually say, I have lost all my faith and, or any kind of belief in a power greater than myself. So we all know that probably well more than half the population doesn't go to church. How many do you think actually have come to the place where there is no longer a belief in the world of spirit. How many, what, what would you guess? It's really, I, I read an article that it's the, one of the fastest growing sects of the population. What do you think is it? I'll give you, I'll give you either or. More than 10% or less? Yeah. More than 15% uh, or less? It's almost 20%. And uh, they are becoming an increasingly a larger part of our culture and our world. And sometimes I look at the, the world about me. And it's not that I'm so great. But sometimes I do look at the people around me and I think that they sometimes are like sheep without a shepherd. <laughs> and I think there's like, there's two extremes in religion. Two extremes. And I think both extremes, both ends of the polar uh, opposites, um, I think they give religion a really bad name. And here are the two ends. I'll, I'll describe them to you. There's the one end who actually I have a ton of uh, empathy for and sympathy for, and I actually relate to this end more than I do the other end, okay? But this end would be the one that says that the universe and the world about us that we can see with our five senses and which our five senses expanded upon with science so we can see farther away and then farther within that world is the only world that exists. And that there is no higher order or there is no other more subtle reality beyond the material world. 
And they look back at the folks who think there is another order and another higher power. And, and I think they think they're just crazy people. So, I'm not sure how many of you have seen this movie. Uh, the spokesman for this world, he's real acerbic. He's a comedian and just kind of a character. Uh, Bill Mayer, you know this guy? He's just, uh, he's like an outspoken atheist kind of guy. And he has a movie, I can't quite get the name exactly right. I think it's called Religious. And it's sort of a play on ridiculous and religion put together. And I went to see his movie well, a long time ago now. And uh, he's a comedian, so I, I don't, he can make me laugh sometimes. But uh, it's so easy to make fun of religion. I'm, you can't find anybody really more religious than me, right? I mean, I got the badge to prove it. <laughs> so if anybody can make fun of religion, it would be me. And uh, so I find some of his stuff funny. But it's also so easy. It's like, Bill, that, that's just too easy. You've got to think a little deeper than that. I, mean, I can make fun of religion easily enough. So I kind of liked him, but uh, I kind of empathized with his take on the world. But it's not where I live in my uh, heart of hearts. That's one, that's one end of the spectrum of our modern world, which I'm thinking of as people who are sheep without a shepherd. The other end is, are the people who are super religious. And they can look at the material world and not only is it uh, uh, sacred, but it's actually a direct revelation of God. And they can raise up the material world and absolutize it and worship it and claim that this is God. And I think, golly, that doesn't fit my world either. Just for example, once you get into the religious world, some people will say that the Bible is not only the words of people about God, they will say, no, this is the Word of God with a capital W. And I think, how could that possibly be? But they'll take the Bible and they lift it way high in the air and say, I want to say, this is God's word, dictated word for word, without error, without any human influence. And, <laughs> and that's the that other end of the spectrum. And in, in the religious world, another part of it, uh, they will say the priest interprets and speaks for God, which is the part I really like, actually. Okay, okay. I'm just saying, sometimes the pastor, or maybe in the Catholic tradition, the, the clergy, or the bishops, or the pope, I mean, they speak with absolute authority. Like, just the way the Protestants speak of the Bible as absolutely divine and sacred, other folks will say, no, this person is just divine and sacred, and without error, without any problems. That's the part I like the best about me. Or we'll look at our liturgy. And the, thing, the doctrines we say and the, the way we pray. And this book is a prayer book. It's got all kinds of cool prayers in it. Lots of great ways to remember God. But, but some people take this book as if it were God. I saw an advertisement in the paper for another church, the Anglican church. And they're so excited about the prayer book they put in the, in the newspaper. We pray the 1928 prayer. I thought to myself, well, good for you. <laughs> we pray the 79 prayer. <laughs> if somehow God could be encapsulated in a book. Golly. And then we have about seven sac what we call sacraments in our tradition. If you want to be technical about it, if you go back in the back of the prayer book, it says, well, we like two sacraments a lot. Two sacraments a whole lot. And there are five other ones, five other ones we think are pretty cool. So two big ones and five little ones. But either way, we say we really like sacraments because they somehow communicate God to us. 
But it would be a huge uh, misunderstanding to say that any of those rites and rituals and sacraments are equal to God or literally communicate God. So that's why I always take the sacraments really seriously. I try to do my best to be serious about them and understand them. But I never take them when I make a mistake with them and screw them up. I never think I just made the worst thing in the whole world. I think, well, they're important, but I know I didn't just offend God because God's not equated with the sacrament, right? So you got the people on the one side where God is completely absent from the material world, and you got the people on the other side who think God is completely identified with their tradition and their religious world and their book and their ritual and their leaders. And they're, they've made the material world their God, in a way. And here sit the poor Episcopalians in the middle. <laughs> and we say to ourselves, we are a sacramental church. Do you remember, do you remember the, the definition from your old days of what a sacrament is? I know Jim does. Jim has memorized the whole catechesis. So. <laughs> Nevertheless, it says, a sacrament is an external or outward sign of an inner reality and grace, right? It's externally, it's a sign. It, it, it points to something. It implies something. It's a window onto something. But it itself is not the thing, right? So it doesn't quite fit into this religious world over here. Like the Bible is sacramental. It's our sacred book. It reveals to us the stories of God. But we don't equate it with God. It's not identical. Over here, we love bread and wine, and we love the body and blood, and we love all the other sacraments, but we don't say those sacraments are absolutely divine and sacred. We say, no, they are, they are windows and signs and vehicles for the Holy Spirit. Of course, we're just as different from the people on the other side. We say, look, there is something to this world of spirit. There is another reality beyond just the material world. There's a higher order and a higher reality that you can experience. The world is not just an empty place floating through the cosmos like cosmic dust and you happen to get here through evolution and it's just kind of a big accident and there's no meaning or purpose. He said, no, there's a higher and bigger story behind what you see than just what you see. So here we are, these Episcopalians in the middle. We are not spiritless, and yet we don't identify all of our religion with absolute divinity. We are the sacramental people. We believe in God, and when all of these signs are given to us as ways to experience and know something of the higher order. We are sacramental people. And I just wonder if the people who are wandering around out there in the world, at least 20% of them have given up completely on this world of spirit. There's a whole bunch of other people who will never go to a church because it doesn't make any sense to them. I feel like they are people who are like sheep without shepherds because they can't find this middle place. We're here, we are full of spirit and we are full of the Holy Spirit. We believe in God, we believe in what is sacred, we believe in higher power, we believe this higher power wants relationship with us and companionship with us. But we're easy, it's easy for us to make fun of ourselves, make fun of our own tradition, because we don't take ourselves that seriously, we just take God really seriously. <laughs> we are the sacramental people we experience God through the material world. That they are outward and physical signs of an interior and a spiritual reality. That's what's great about the Episcopal Church. That's why I love being an Anglican. And that's why I think we could show people this balance. And we could be a real service to our culture 
and to the world around us. So they're not stuck between two polar opposites. The one over here says, we've got God in our pocket. We know all about it. We'll tell you exactly what God is like. People on the other side say, there's no such thing as above God. And it's all a bunch of silliness, like Bill Mayer. You've got to be right here in the middle and say, oh, I go to a church where they know and love God, but they don't take themselves too seriously. Their tradition is good. They have outward forms of religion, but they know the form is not the thing. They know the material is only a window and an aperture and a, a way to feel and express their knowledge and love of God. So, that's just the vision I wanted to put out there for you today and say it out there in words. It's kind of where I'm at personally these days and uh, I wonder if we could, together, you and I could kind of reclaim and just be proud of and excited about your own heritage, your own tradition, and this worldview that's kind of in the middle, right where we're supposed to be. People who love God and don't take themselves too seriously. That appreciate the material world, but know that it's a window on to something larger and deeper than just the material world. So that's a vision I wanted to share with you today and maybe just remind you of our own heritage. We're about to do some new things in our own congregation, our own church, because we've rebuilt the downstairs. If you're visiting today, it's a long, long story. I won't bother you with it. But <laughs> we're, we're kind of at a, a turning point in our congregation because we've got a brand new building downstairs and we have opportunity to uh, expand our ministries. And because we're at this turning point, I wanted to remind you of the best parts of what it means to be a Christian in the Anglican world, in the Episcopal world. We are the sacramental people where the world is full of spirit and yet the world itself is not identified with God. Nothing is, only God himself. We are the sacramental people. So I'm sure I'm not telling you stuff you don't already know. But I wanted to celebrate that with you today because I think the message you bring and the life you lead uh, can bring the people who are without a shepherd to a place where they can know the shepherd. I, I offer this to you in the name of God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.